isn't it? Very, very few people I know uh, walk <coughs> mindfully. They tend to, we walk habitually and uh, don't even notice what we're doing. So this, in this way, is a walking meditation is noting and being with the body walking. And when the mind wanders off and you start thinking or doubting or feeling bored or restless with it, uh, you note that. You notice that the mind is, that you, you're not with the, the movement of your feet anymore. And then you bring your attention back to the feet. Now, when, when you, one, one of the important uh, hints in training this way is to uh, recognize that when you determine to do something and you fail at it, you have a sense of disappointment or hopelessness. So, so the, if, you're, if you're determined to do this walking practice and keep your mind concentrated on your feet and then your mind wanders all over the place, you're going, to feel, uh, you're going to feel disappointed all the time, or bored, or restless, or, or uh, negative states will overtake your mind. So that's, that's because you've, your, your ego is still involved in what you're doing. You're still wanting to become someone who concentrates and mind doesn't wander. So let go of that desire, to note that desire of wanting to be successful and and make yourself do what you think you should be doing, and, and then feeling uh, disappointed and hopeless when, when it doesn't happen, when you can't do it. But see, the, the, it's the, the way of training in this way is always humbling, because it, it, the most simple things are very difficult for us. Just to be with your, your body walking for half an hour is, uh, is, is difficult. So you're training uh, the mind as soon as, the, as, the, as it wanders away and you're aware that you, you're, you're, you've wandered off, you're thinking about something, then humbly and patiently bring your attention back to, the, to your feet again. So you're, you're being one who's very humble and patient rather than an ambitious meditator who's, who's trying to force yourself to, do, to live up to some high standard you've set and then you're always failing, and then you feel discouraged by your practice. So it doesn't matter how many times your mind wanders, you're not, we're not, we're not uh, going to give awards, prizes to anyone during this retreat. It's not a competition. So that you, you uh, but the, the uh, wise using wisdom in the walking practice means that you can uh, at least uh, uh, humbly and patiently do these very, make, practice in these very simple ways. For those who, who walk slowly, that's quite all right. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I have, I'm, in regards to technique, I'm not particularly. Uh, uh, concerned with, with the techniques of meditation so much as an attitude of mind. What trying to inculcate in, into you in this retreat is, is an attitude uh, rather than give you a, a technique that you have to do, Ajahn Sumedho's technique. <laughs> so if you, if you, I mean, probably you've been to so many retreats already, some of you, with all different teachers, and Everybody has their own style, so it's, it's not uh, a matter of, of one technique being superior or better than another, even though we all kind of prefer our own techniques to somebody else's, which is quite natural. <laughs> but the, uh, um, the attitude is developing the right attitude will help you to integrate this retreat with your ordinary life because you might not be able to, to say, live your life in this way when you leave this, this uh, retreat center, but you can develop a right attitude toward your life in whatever you're doing, working or living with your family, uh, whatever you have to do 
<laughs> you, you can at least develop an attitude that is wise and conducive to enlightenment. Or here there's some kind of confusion about the uh, precepts, especially the six precepts, about food. And this, the Vikala Pochana, uh, the six precepts, is a vow to not eat outside of the designated times, which in uh, Buddhist uh, monasteries is you don't eat after 12 noon. Uh, you don't eat meals. They have certain, uh, like, uh, certain allowances of uh, drinks and uh, various things like uh, um, they allow cheese to be eaten in the afternoon and and honey things like that but but a real meal uh, or what would be considered a meal is is usually uh, not part of it's not allowed in the, after 12 noon so this is a tradition say in, in uh, Thailand Sri Lanka lay people go to the monastery uh, in the morning t taking the eight precepts then they would eat their last meal would be before noon and then they wouldn't eat till dawn of the next day. <clears throat> so that is, uh, it's to, in order for you to reflect on, on and not to, to look forward or not to, uh, to be able to see your own habits. For example, people do develop so many kind of uh, habits around food and eating is uh, one of the great distractions that we use in life to avoid issues. Uh, so what I encourage you to do is really use it to, to, to uh, just see your own anxieties or uh, feelings of wanting something to eat in the evening, if that's what you're used to doing, so that you, you can begin to learn how dependent one is upon having things a certain way. Uh, a form like this is, is, uh, is to give you that reflection on just, say, on sleep, on eating, on uh, the need for distractions and, and uh, entertainments, uh, not to mention the, the first five about uh, this basic moral, moral uh, commitments, like the, the last the the last three precepts are, are not m more moral precepts. They're uh, renunciate precepts. They're you you did there's nothing immoral about eating eating dinner in 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 the evening. But or there's nothing immoral about dancing or singing or going to shows or sleeping uh, in a comfortable bed. There's not not uh, nothing to do with morality, but they're their uh, forms of renunciation in order to to be able to see what your mind does uh, or to simplify life for example in a in a monastery in uh, <coughs> in Thailand uh, we were only allowed one meal a day uh, we here we have we tend to have two actually a breakfast and the meal before noon in Thailand we we wouldn't even have the breakfast uh, so that and you're, you're, once you resign yourself to that, it makes life very simple. Your mind does not really uh, go around thinking about food all the time. Because when it's not available or you can't have it, then you more or less give up uh, thinking about it. If you give choices, like if, if I said, well, there are those of you who want to have a meal in the evening, you can, and those that don't want to, then don't. Then you, I'd be giving you more of a problem. <laughs> because then you think, well, I could have a meal this evening. <laughs> 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 
So in one way it makes it, it like I found the uh, monastic life really a very, as a simplification uh, of life because your options and choices diminish considerably. I'm not trying to make you into monks or nuns, but to, but to give you a, a, uh, a way of reflecting on, on your habits, on the, the accumulations of your life. Uh, not to intimidate you, but but just so you can maybe see how how your mind, how dependent one becomes on routine, on food, on on things like cigarettes and drink, and on <coughs> television and on social encounters and so forth. It's just we we're so so we we are creatures of habit and. Uh, if we, if we, but we can transcend the habits, is, is what we're saying. We don't have to be just victims of our conditioning. In fact, in I think most of us have experimented a lot with fasting. We, We've found it, you know, you can eat one meal every other day and still feel all right. <laughs> and you can even go without food for a week and still be all right. <laughs> I mean, physically, it's just uh, me mentally, one might be all over the place. But I found that a relief, actually, because I was brought up in a family that you, you had to have three meals a day, three square meals a day, and and if I didn't have, if I missed one square meal, my mother would say, oh, "You're going to ruin your health." <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I had this is my my kind of, in my you know instilled in my brain, so, so I always had this feeling you had to have three meals a day and eight hours of sleep, to, otherwise you'd lose your health. And uh, in monastic life, I found, you know, how that one can, can go without food or for quite long periods of time. And, it, and not to torture oneself, I didn't do it out of a kind of masochistic uh, intentions. Or I'm not an ascetic, but just to see what my limits are, what what I can take, what happens when I when I can't get what I want, or my habit life is disrupted. And so you can you're watching, you're you're, you're using the, the the experiences to to observe what suffering is and the end of suffering. You see suffering and and the end of it. So a technique I've used in my life as a monk is I found very helpful, which I will pass on to you and let's see if it is give you it helps you at all. And uh, those of you who've been on my retreats before have already know this, but. Um, I've developed the listening to what we call the sound of silence or the, the nada or what's called nada yoga and this, this um, is an ancient form of yoga I've heard it's almost disappeared and I, and I discovered it quite by I'm just on my own, really, before I knew that it had a name. And this was uh, my first year uh, as a monk in Thailand. I'd find that uh, I'd be hearing this, this kind of high vibra vibrational sound 
uh, almost like an electronic sound as a kind of background. Uh, and of course, uh, one, I thought it was, I didn't quite know what it was, I thought it was some kind of maybe um, something wrong with my ears. But the, the thing was that it seemed to, to be, uh, have a continuous uh, quality to it. And the fact that one, when one paid attention to it, uh, it helped to calm and uh, to center, to ground oneself a lot. So I call this the listening to the sound, uh, the inner sound or the sound of silence. And then talking to other people about it, that other, then I realize other people also also uh, have that same experience. Uh, so far in Buddhism, I've never heard it talked about uh, as a practice. Uh, I did mention it once to Ajahn Chah, and he, he certainly seemed aware of it. But if you, if you detect it, once you acknowledge it, then it helps to, if, and you begin to uh, bring it into consciousness, it's, uh, it will help you to let go of things, to be able to empty the mind, the mind quite, quite uh, empty at that time. There's, the mind is reflective, it's not highly concentrated, so you're not kind of absorbed in anything, but it offers a kind of backdrop, uh, a grounding, uh, a centering, rather, so that one's ability to, say, let go of things it increases. Uh, you can, I found it much uh, a, a very uh, helpful way of letting go of, say, very, very difficult things, like an emotional, highly fraught emotional experiences are very difficult to get any perspective on, because you're, if, you're, if you really uh, have a strong emotion in your mind, then you, uh, it's very difficult to, to not either suppress it or to just go, go on and on with it. Uh, so, uh, I found anapanasati sometimes, where you try and more, tended to be more suppressive towards emotion, uh, where I found uh, concentrating or listening to the sound of silence very helpful because uh, just by staying with that for, say, the count of ten, remember when your mother used to say, now, before you say anything when you're angry, count to ten. <laughs> There's a certain amount of wisdom in that saying, actually. <laughs> and, and the, but if you listen to the uh, sound of silence and count to ten, it'll even be better. So, you know, this morning, see if you can, uh, sit when you're sitting this, during this hour, see if you can, uh, it's like, uh, detect this sound. It's a high pitch, fairly high pitch and a continuous uh, a uh, kind of ringing, reverberating uh, sound. Sometimes at first you don't even like it, but actually once you, once you, uh, some people like it a lot, some people find it irritating, but once you uh, recognize it, you'll find it very helpful and, and, and the aversion or the uh, reaction to it will also cease. Now, it's very helpful also when you're, say, when you are uh, in uh, stressful situations. Uh, it helps to, to keep, to give you some place to, to have a perspective. And if you're, you're in rather tense or difficult situations in, say, social scenes or, or work, whatever you're doing, it helps enormously to be able to, to reflect on that sound. 
because uh, that way you, you, you'll be able to stop the kind of habitual reactions that you might be having in regards to a tent, tense uh, situation. You won't just be suppressing or, or, uh, or just trying to hold everything down out of fear and anxiety, but you'll actually be more kind of observant and cool in, re- in regards to your own reaction. Now, some people uh, do not find it, uh, do not hear it, or uh, but don't, that's all right too. If you if you can't detect it, uh, don't don't make a problem about that. <laughs> but, uh, eventually, it will. You find it, especially uh, as your as your mind is more quiet uh, <clears throat> and you're not so kind of busy with just the going around with your thoughts, uh, your own thoughts, you will, you, will, uh, you will hear it. It's a good thing to try to listen to it, especially to, to make it a practice, not only when it's quiet uh, and the conditions are very conducive, but also I recommend using it in very noisy situations, like in traffic jams or when uh, somebody's using a chainsaw, cutting down a tree near your house, or, or uh, uh, a loud motorcycle without a muffler goes by. <laughs> it's uh, very helpful to try to, to listen to that rather than follow maybe uh, feelings of aversion to the, to the unpleasant sounds. So it's like listening. One of the... Uh, ways of liberation is through listening. And we're sawakas or listeners to the Dhamma. Uh, we, we listen. And listening is, uh, is always implies a, an attentiveness of mind. You're, to listen to somebody, to listen to anything, you have to pay attention. No? You have to be with, with it. You have to be open. Now, if you're really listening to somebody what they're saying, you have to, uh, you have to pay attention, and uh, and uh, really try to be with them when they're speaking. So you're you're mindful. You're 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 using your ability to to hear and to listen, in order to to fully get to fully try to understand what somebody's saying to you. Uh, well, apply that also inwardly to your own. To, to your own mind. This sense of attentive, really sharp at, uh, attention and listening to the sound of silence. Listening to the, uh, the inner voices, the, the, the whispers and the Winds and the complaints that go on in the mind. Listening to them uh, is is an, is a practice of listening to the inner voices, so that you're hearing what they say. You're not just reacting to them. You're not believing them, or you're not denying them. You're listening, and you see that they arise and they cease. If you listen to the inner voices and the, the conditioned mind that set that gets triggered off at certain moments you will you will you'll be listening to different personalities different qualities of emotion that arise and cease in the mind and what is left when they when they cease the sound of silence still remains after all the the dramas the melodramas the the angels and demons and the whole range of characters uh, that can arise and cease in one's own mind. When they've all ceased, there's still the, the reverberating nada. Now, nada means sound in uh, Sanskrit. 
in Spanish it means nothing. <laughs> Doesn't it? Nothing. <laughs> So it has significant meaning both in Spanish and in Sanskrit. Okay, now I'll leave you to, to uh, your practice and uh, see if you can uh, detect this. When you hear it, then, then sustain it, try to, to really be conscious of it, like you're listening to it. Then when your mind wanders, you start thinking, carried away with things, then as soon as you're aware that you're thinking or you're, you, your mind's wandering, then try to listen to the sound again, the sound of silence. Practice with it, like if you've got really some obsessive thoughts going on in your mind and, and or, or some kind of really unpleasant or uh, repetition or obsessive thinking, then, then try to uh, listen to the sound of silence, say to the count of ten, and then see what, if you can remember all clearly what or exactly what it was you were obsessed with. It's an experiment. See, uh, how when you're when you're going to the sound of silence and for a span of time the the kind of power of an emotion you're allowing to diminish because you're not feeding it you're not you're not reinforcing that emotion at that time though more and more you can uh, you you will be able to say do things work uh, walk even attend committee meetings. And have a, find a place that you can remain much more centered uh, in yourself and, and be more aware of what's actually happening than, than before. Like I found uh, this very helpful in committee meetings because if, if I center myself in there, then I can I'm more aware of what's actually happening in the, in the, uh, with the other people around me. I'm more in tune, in touch with the actual mood and the situation I'm in, where uh, committee meetings, as you all know, can, one can be very much caught up into somebody's take, si taking sides on issues or, or uh, be highly influenced by a very strong a uh, person who's coming across in a very strong and uh, way that that one is uh, easily kind of influenced by if you can if you can use this uh, nada sound more then you find a way of, of of not suppressing or out of anger or aversion but much more uh, keep centered and cool in regards to the things that are going on uh, around you and inside you.